Welcome back to the morning show here on Arise News. I'm Rafai Yoseni. Process and Industrial Development Limited, PIA and ID, are seeking the right to see some $9 billion in assets from the Nigerian government for the aborted gas project. The failed project was to build a gas processing plant in the southern Nigerian city of Calabar in Cross River State. The Nigerian government lawyers had argued that the award should not be enforced because England was not the correct place for the case. The lawyers also insisted that the amount awarded was manifestly excessive. In the view of the judgment, Debt and Processing Industrial Development Limited, who won the case, can seize the country's foreign reserves or assets totally $9 billion anywhere in Europe or in the West. And with this, Nigeria already reeling under a protracted economy, the country may likely expect another damaging recession very soon if that happens. So joining us now to shed more light on this issue is Shola Oshudi John, Registrar and CEO of Nigerian Institute of Chartered Arbitrators. It's a joy having you, Ma. Good morning, sir. Thank Great you. to talk to you. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here this morning. Let's talk about this. Let's, let's get into the case. This happened under uh, President Omar Musa Ardua of Blessed Memories. What happened? Well, during President Musa Ardua's tenure, um, a contract was entered into with P and ID to build um, a gas facility in Cross River State. And the federal government said they were going to build, provide the pipelines. And actually, the contract was meant to favor Nigeria. It was in the interest of Nigeria it had to do with the power sector to ensure that we have better delivery of power. Unfortunately, along the line, we don't know what happened. Nigeria reneged on its own part of the deal. And P and ID took us to court, took us to arbitration, because there was an arbitration clause in the contract. And like you know, once you have an arbitration clause in the contract, it means that if there is a dispute or any likely feeling that I'm not sure that you're going to perform your own part, I can go to arbitration to seek redress. And that was what they did. Unfortunately, I don't know what happened. I don't know who represented Nigeria, but I think that probably we didn't get it right at that point. I mean, uh, Chibology, I heard there's a name that comes to mind, and uh, Shupo Shasha Ore was another name in, in terms of the representation of this country and negotiation of a deal. Well, are you talking about the, at the contract stage or at the arbitration? No, at the arbitration stage. Okay, no. well, before you get to arbitration, the deal was messed up at the contract stage. How? Pre-contract stage, because there was nothing there saying that if... P and ID did not perform their own part. Nigeria would be able to do so, so and so. It was left open-ended. Normally, at the pre-contract stage, when you are dealing with investors, there are certain clauses you need to also add. That in case there's a change in the circumstance, there's a change in the conditions of operation, that the deal can be renegotiated, or parties can step out of the deal or out of the contract. But that was not done. What we had was something, it was like, um, it was like we just gave PID the free will to write, shove on us, and do what they want. So that was what they did. I mean, if you say there's that big clause, is it that the negotiation team of the federal government didn't put, didn't put this in place? No. It was not is it, is it that the attorney general at that time wasn't aware of these clauses in negotiations you should put in there? With due respect, I think that sometimes one, one of the challenges we have in Nigeria is that we think that because I occupy a particular office, I can provide expertise. No. In, an, in a situation like this, what they needed were core professionals, people that have expertise in, in contract negotiations and drafting, people that have expertise in pri private and public partnership contracts. Those are the people that should be on the team. So we probably if we go back and revisit the team, you will find out that you didn't have such expertise available to Nigeria. Because if you did, they would never assign a contract like that. For your information, the P and ID didn't even fulfill their own part of the contract. So, on what basis? P and ID didn't fulfill their part no. of the contract. I mean, but there were talks about them, you know, promoting the contract no. and, and they did. The, the, the part of the contract was that they were going to build the gas plant facility. Nigeria government was going to provide the pipeline to transmit gas to the facility. They didn't never. Pro they never built any facility. Nigerian government also did not provide the pipeline. 
Uh, so, but you would logically and technically think that since they didn't build any gas pipeline and Nigeria didn't provide the facility, it was two over four. So there was no case for a case there. Well, technically, you know, from the layman's perspective, it looks like that. But then you have to look at who defaulted. Who, did, who, who defaulted? Who le what led to the breakup, the breach? What was the fundamental breach here? Who, led, who did it? The federal government, according to PID, they were ready to build the facility. But the federal government frustrated the contract because they did not provide How did they the frustrate pipeline. the contract? How do you frustrate a contract that you know there are going to be arbitrary repercussions? How do you frustrate that contract? If you sign a contract and you do not respect the sanity of contract, then that is what's going to happen to you. Over the years, unfortunately for us, down the line, we have formed this habit of not keeping to our own terms of contract. This is not the first time. This is not the second. It's been on for a long time. So what was done? And uh, you, as the Nigerian Institute of uh, Transit Arbitrators, when you started seeing the flames of this manifest, 2010, 2011, 2012, what was done to be able to stem the tide of this? As of 2010, when they went to arbitration, and they could still have negotiated, they could still have said, listen, come out of arbitration. The reason why, from my understanding, the follow-up of this case was that the reason why, after Jonathan's tenure, there was an agreement to pay, I believe, about $800 million to p and I D For doing nothing? Well, you... In contract, it's, there's not like for doing nothing because they have done feasibility studies, they have done a lot of pre-contract, um, they're taking pre-contract steps and have incurred certain amounts of liabilities, mm -hmm. you know, that who was going to pay it, who was going to pay it. So they needed to be compensated for that. And I believe because they needed to be compensated for that and also for the loss of income, so to say, for the 20 years period that this contract would have ran, was what they asked for. But we had a very good opportunity to, which was done initially, to say, okay, you know what, step out of arbitration, let's negotiate. They did that, and they arrived at some form of arrangement. Unfortunately, at that point in time, there was a change of government in Nigeria. Jonathan was coming out, and President Buhari was coming in. And I don't know for what reason why this present regime did not revisit this matter and ensured that he didn't get to this level. Some say it was because at that point in time, Nigeria was in reception. Yes, and I said to myself, if Nigeria was in reception, then you could have, like I said, come back and say, listen, there is change conditions here. Things are not what it was when we signed this deal. Can we now renegotiate it? Or, okay, can we now do this thing in phases? Because the truth of the matter was that this deal was meant to favor Nigerians. How do you cancel? a gas contract that will end gas flaring in Nigeria. If you live in the Niger Delta, you will know that gas flaring is one of the major environmental hazards that people face. What was the reason for that? Hmm. Okay, so there are so many issues involved in this matter. Unfortunately, when we get to hear about this matter, we had made certain steps to try and intervene, and it just did not work out. I don't know whether it's the way the Nigerian bureaucracy is structured. Even as far back as three months ago, we offered to help. To say, listen, I wrote an article on this, and I said, listen, you know what? There are no easy way out of this. We, something must give. Let's come up with a team, assist the federal government to negotiate this thing out, even though they are at the enforcement stage. We didn't hear from anybody about it. But, but let me take you on this. I mean, it just goes to show a lot of misnomer in this. Uh, currently, if you're in the oil and gas industry space, you'll see that the federal government brought out sort of like a quota system for companies to bid for gas flares, for gas flare sites. And if we had an existing contract with P and ID still for gas flare sites, was it that there was not a transition or sort of like an understanding of what the government had done prior to now? Because now they're telling companies, and, and they keep even extending the window. In fact, they'll shut the window, they extend the window. 
and telling companies to bid for the gas flare site, you know, companies will come in and say, okay, you know, you flare to this, you trap gas, and you, you're able to use it. So, because just you saying this now, I remember that that project is currently on by the federal government, but they had a pre-existing contract on one of those purported sites in Cross River. Is it that we don't do proper handshake or we don't even know what's going on in governance? I believe that this is one of the major challenges we face in Nigeria and as Nigerians. And that has to do with no proper records. There is no depository of data that can tell you in the last 60 years, these are the contracts that the federal government of Nigeria has entered into. These are our responsible and obligations. But aside from that, I remember and I recall that there was some form of handover about this arbitration award to the present regime. But there was no follow through. And at the point where they decided to follow through, the issue of national interest probably was not really taken into consideration. You don't follow through such a deal like this and go out there and shop for foreigners to put your case, to defend your case. And the foreigner is there to make his money. But when you get in Nigeria and then understand that this is a, 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 a do or die affair, national interest is involved here, they will go all out to do the needful. Part of the thing that I see as a challenge again is that there's no consultation, cross consultation between the, 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 the public sector, the private sector, and the professional organizations. In a contract like this, you needed to have engineers, expert engineers in the team, you needed petroleum engineers, you needed lawyers, you needed all manner of technocrats as part of the Nigerian team. This is not the first time this is happening, this is not the second. And if nothing is done about it to nip it in board, it will continue like this. It will shock you to know that there's more awards coming right now in no, different apart from courts. This? Yes. Both in the US and in the UK. I mean, are this something that you're privy to that you, you will tell us here so that Nigerians can be ready for it? Well, I, I, would, I would wait for the appropriate parties to, to tell Nigerians about it because it's going, to be all, all going, it's going to be in the public domain any moment from now. You understand? But the lesson, we need to learn some lessons. And the lesson here is when we want to go out to negotiate deals like this, contracts like this, we must make sure we put our best 11 forward. We must not compromise on the basis of, of, of bureaucracy, on the basis of party affiliation, uh, 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 affiliations. We must not compromise. We must go out there and get the right people with the right expertise, round pegs in round holes. That's the only way forward. I want to let you know this. This is not only, uh, this is not happening only to Nigeria. It is more like a third world or a developing country thing. Even Pakistan. In the same July, when this matter broke and became a, a national issue, Pakistan has a $5.8 billion award against it as well for something similar to this, for reneging, declining to fulfill their own part of a mining lease. Uh, uh, a lot of people say, and this is a general opinion out there, but I want you to defend it. A lot of people say even the bulk of our Paris club debts are from arbitrations, contracts not fulfilled, side of government bargain not fulfilled. Is that true? Yeah. A good part of it is. A good part of those Paris Club debts? Yes, it is. You can go far, as ba far back as 30 years ago, if you know the story of the monorail for Lagos State. Mm. We'll come back and we'll talk about the story of the monorail and, and missed all the stories. Uh, but in case you're just joining us here, uh, we've got Shala Oshodi John, Registrar CEO, Nigerian Institute of Chartered Arbitrators. And we'll talk about the monorail. We'll talk about other projects that have gone through uh, this same treatment. And we'll look, start to look for possibilities on how we can solve them. And we we'll also talk about a very interesting twist. I'll bring in a name to this. Ngozi Okonja Wela wrote something about things like this in her book after the break. We'll be right back. Welcome back. Still the morning show here on Arise News. And we've got with us Shola Ushudi John, Registrar and CEO of Nigeria and Institute of Chartered Arbitrators. And we're talking a lot about this uh, nine billion uh, US dollar for future by P uh, and ID. So what happened 20 years ago with the monorail project? I mean, because so we can build a case 
and also come back to this in this conversation. What happened 20 years ago with the motor 30 years ago. 30 years ago. Because it was during the time of Latif Jacondi. Yes. Alaji Latif Jacondi. Yes. That thought 90 just recently. Yes. A contract was awarded for the construction of a monorail to open up Lagos and to ease the traffic. You know, Jack Onde was a leader with foresight. He, he, he knew that where we are today, we're going to get here. And it was like, let's do this. Create jobs, open up the Lagos space. At that point in time, Lagos had, was really growing at a very fast rate. But in between the period that the contract was awarded, there was some form of transition. From, Just like this? Though. Yes, from Chagaris region to the present president, Muhammad Boaiz, they took over then, and the monorail contract was cancelled. And we had to pay even the same amount of money, if not even more, than what it would have cost us to construct the monorail. I think the monorail was about 100 million then. Because uh, Elijah Kolau Saini was here and talked about that. I think the deal was from Astrum, a uh, French company then. Yeah, and a lot of consultum firms, banks agreed to, to support it because they saw the benefits. They saw the benefits of the monorail and they knew that they needed to do it for Lagos State. And Lagos State government even said we're going to fulfill their own part, come up with 10%. But I don't like it was. There's, there's, there's a lot that has been going on in this country for such a long time. And I, I, as a Nigerian, I'm sad. It bleeds my heart to see us with all the resources that God has blessed us with to find out that we are still living from hand to mouth. Because people at the end of leadership have failed to do the right thing. You know, it doesn't cost us anything as a nation to, to put together a team. When Nigeria sends out representatives, to sign deals like this, contracts like this, enter into arrangements, negotiations like this. When you look at the, no, the, um, the names of people sitting on that team, it will shock you to find out that you don't have any experts in the team. So how can they protect the interests of Nigeria even when they want to? When they're not subject master experts, they don't understand the nitty the you know, the, 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 the little T's and, 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 the, and the soft prints that goes a long way to determine whether this contract is in your favor or not. When we sign deals, do we look out for the interest of Nigeria as a nation? Let, let, let me take you up on this. Uh, and this is privileged information. Uh, only recently, you were saying this is already at the enforcement stage. Yes. That even our last ditch effort to be able to pull Failed in pull the UK. This, yes, this was yesterday. Yes, it failed. So it caught sat in the UK yesterday. Yeah. Nigeria's objection. Yes, that's yesterday, Sunday. It called SAT in the UK and was trying to review the case. Not on of, Sunday. I um, think it was Friday. On so, Friday. Yeah. And sat and tried to review Nigeria's objection to this. The enforcement, the execution of the award against Nigeria. And, 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 and what happened? Nigeria. It failed. It didn't scale through because, like, I don't know if you're aware about it. They were claiming uh, the issue of sovereignty, state immunity. But, you know, in international law, State immunity is not absolute. It is only absolute when you are talking about jurisdictional issues, when you are dealing with issues that has to do with the existence, whatever will be inimical, inimical to the existence of the state and the welfare of the citizens of that country, you can talk about absolute immunity. But in this instance where the federal government of Nigeria has gone out, entered into a business transaction, to take, you know, to, to take a gain or a profit from it. Your immunity becomes restricted. So your immunity becomes restricted. And then you go forward and even sign a contract that has an arbitration clause. You have said to the parties and to the, to the nations, every other person that, listen, you know what? I have stepped out of my immunity. I have waived my rights to sovereign immunity to do this thing. And therefore, on the terms of the contract that I've signed, my, the, on the terms of the contract that I've signed, I can be taken up. As an entity. As an entity in commercial space, international commercial space. Hmm. 
That is what has happened. So that has failed in the courts yes, that's in the failed. UK as we speak. Yes. And you say they're at enforcement stage. So that means there's no going back. Any time from now, they'll start stripping those assets? Yeah. So what kind of assets are they going to do? Well, that's about 20% of our foreign reserves. Well, you, you see, the kind of asset under international law, they cannot touch assets that has to do with existence that will affect the existence of Nigeria. For instance, they cannot touch central bank because mm. uh, Nigeria as a nation depends and relies on the central bank to run its economy. Because if you go after the central bank, you, it means you, you, ruin, you ruin Nigeria's economy. Mm. But there are other assets that they can go after. And if these people have been on this for five years and they have spent a lot of money to get to this point, there are some assets that you and I do not know about that they're going to go after. Mm. So, of course, people say, well... Can they, can they go after, you know, oil installations? But be, before we talk about this asset, uh, we understand that uh, there's a fire which got two rows in the Katangwa market, uh, has been extinguished by fire service. Uh, uh, we just hope uh, people around there are safe at this period. Uh, uh, we're just getting the alert now that the fire that got parts of Katangwa market has been established on your screen. There you can see pictures... Uh, uh, of people dealing with that. So le let's go back to talking about these assets. I mean, because straight off the bat, uh, a lot of people might not know, but I know we have oil installation assets, joint partnerships and things like that. Even in the UK, for instance, I mean, uh, I think the NNPC and uh, Duke Oil and things like that. I mean, are these those assets they're going to take or can they, how's it going to go? They can go after assets that Nigeria makes profit from. Mm. That is the business concern for Nigeria. Okay, why are they able to go after our assets? It's because when it gets to enforcement stage and execution stage of arbitration awards, the law that is operational is the law of the state or the country where the matter is before, where the asset is in. So you can say that in Nigeria, yes, we're talking about absolute sovereignty in Nigeria, we have immunity, because Nigerian law, like the Spanish law, is, takes the, the conservative line, they told the conservative line, mm. to say immunity is absolute, there's no going back. But when we're talking about the UK, the US, no. They have been able to look at, over the years, they've come to a place where they've found that, that state parties have become, uh, it has become a culture for state parties not to fulfill their own parts of agreements. How are we going to avoid this going forward? You know, because we just signed the deal with Morocco as regards gas pipelines. How are we show sure of the content of those deals? Because, I mean, we can see the optics in the media, we've signed a deal. What is in those deals? How are we protecting our part in those deals? We're about to get into an agreement with Siemens, another top company. Uh, provision of over 22,000 megawatts of electricity. How are we going to protect our interest in those deals? What should be done going forward? I think the starting point for us is that contracts like this, we should have a depository, we should have a data database where all the contracts, all the treaties that Nigeria has signed from inception to date is kept there. It is in the public space. Okay. Where we can look at who are these people representing us? What are the kind of obligations and responsibility that Nigeria holds to third parties? Are they onerous? Are they in our interest? Are they in our favor? What steps have we taken so far to ensure that we meet up with our obligations and where the obligations of the, the third parties are not met, that we can also go after them? We need to have that as, 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 as at yesterday. In public space. Yes. Because if it's not in the public space, then you are not able to know what is going on. And you're not able to even hold anybody responsible, responsible. I believe that some people that are involved from the pre-contract stage, the pre negotiation stage to date, should be held responsible for what has happened. So that leads me to a question I quickly want to ask as we wrap up. Okonde Weller wrote in a book called something called the contract scam, that a contract is given to a certain company, some people in government go to the back and tell that person, will help government default on the contract, you take them to court, you win the case, and they pay you 
Lodja Kala wrote about that in her book. Can this be another case of a contract scam? And you predicted more slams like this to come, that there are many arbitration cases going on around the world. Do you want to say? Well, you see, there is a possibility that it's a contract scam. Mm. We cannot rule that out. But the only way you can really say for sure that there has been a scam is to investigate it, is to put this whole issue in the public domain so Nigerians can be aware and know who and who were involved. We need to, I, I, I just like what the, the governor of Ekit State is doing. They have set up, I mean, I know I'm, I'm deviating now because yeah. it has nothing to do with we what we're talking not about. Much time. Yeah. You know, but we need to begin to do that. For us as an institute, come, Oct come October, I'm sorry, November the 14th and 15th, the Nigerian Institute of Arbitrage is holding its annual conference. We are going to be dealing with issues like this as part of the sub-teams for our conference. This year, we've decided that we want to talk about a culture, building a culture of arbitration and sustainable institutions. If we don't have a culture of arbitration, and some of the excuses, time will not permit us, some of the reasons that we're giving mm. would not hold water as to why the award cannot scale through. Mm. It would not hold water because we started mm. from a defensive perspective. We could also mm. have slammed a counterclaim against P&ID for mm. not also fulfilling their own part of the contract. There were so many things we could have done that we did not do. So come this period, November mm. 14th and 15th at Eco Hotel and Suites, okay. I assure you that we would look into this issue because there's a need for national okay. policy okay. on arbitration. And we need to do that. Thank you so much, man. Really, really appreciate you. Thank uh, you. And you've spoken very well. Thank you so much. Really appreciate you for your time.